Starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, uh, 15 Ways to Increase Your Content Marketing Performance. Uh, just to ensure you can hear me loud and clear, can you type hi or something into your chat window, or even better, sticking with tradition, um, tell us the weather in your area. I'll give you a mm -hmm. couple of minutes to do that. See what people are saying. Any, uh, just checking people are listening. Sorry, guys, one second. Oh, mild, quite sunny. Okay, here we go. Yep, we've got some responses, so that's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so um, so my name is Jonathan Sape. I'm the founder of eMarketeers, and it's really good to have you all here today. Very, very much appreciate you signing in to this lunchtime webinar. Uh, just a, a wee bit of housekeeping. And then we'll crack on. Uh, so regarding today's lunchtime webinar, Kelvin will be speaking for about 30 minutes, which means if you do have questions, uh, we'll have around five, 10 minutes at the end for those. Um, feel free to write down any questions you've got and you can add them to your uh, chat window in your software. If um, you, if we can't answer questions, by all means, email me after today's webinar and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, just to let you know, we're also recording this webinar, so we'll be uploading a copy of the slides and an actual recording, audio recording, uh, to our blog either today or Monday. So that will be available at www.emarketeers.com. So uh, just a quick introduction to Kelvin, and then I'll let him crack on. Um, so Kelvin is a true digital native. Uh, he lives and breathes SEO, social media, content marketing, you name it, he, he does it. Um, he's the founder of Rough Agenda, uh, an organization that helps digital marketers keep their skills in tip-top condition through digital conferences and events. So very much allied to what we do at eMarketeers. Um, the best known event that you may, may know of is the very oversubscribed and very popular Brighton SEO, which I can hardly recommend having been there myself. Um, you also might want to check out MeasureFest and the Content Marketing Show as well, um, which are great events, or also organized by Kelvin and Rough Agenda. Um, Kelvin's also worked in the SEO industry for about a decade. Uh, he was formerly, or kind of current, currently is, I guess, strategy director at Site Visibility, where he's worked on lots of high-profile SEO campaigns, the likes of Hotels.com, FindAProperty.com, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, he's also responsible for the iTunes, for iTunes rather, most popular digital marketing podcast downloaded by something like a million people or, or more, perhaps. Uh, and finally, he's also the author of the very quirky book and well worth reading, um, Becoming a Clockwork Pirate, which, believe it or not, is about SEO, if I'm right in saying. <laughs> so without further, further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Kelvin. Kelvin, take it away. Yeah, hello everybody, and thanks for um, joining us this afternoon. So yeah, um, as we kind of talked about there, um, I'm going to be talking about um, particularly tools, but also some techniques that potentially you can use to increase the success of your content marketing. Um, and I suppose it's worth starting off by kind of setting the scene a bit in terms of what is content marketing, what are some of the definitions that people have for it. So um, content marketing is really, really been around for absolute decades. To be completely honest, the first Michelin guide, which was created um, over 100 years ago, um, was created to encourage people to drive around and potentially use their tyres more than they were doing anyway. Um, but more recently, over the last couple of years, um, there really has been an increase in the number of people talking about content marketing. So that's for a number of reasons. Um, partially, it's because the nature of SEO is changing. So the tactics that perhaps historically um, would have been part of an SEO campaign are becoming more and more driven by content. Um, social media, as it matures, people are increasingly realizing the importance of content rather than just having the networks in place. And of course, there's content strategy, which has been around for a long period of time, and even custom publishing and contract publishing, which has gone through a bit of a change. This little graph here is from Google Trends, uh, which kind of shows the kind of general increase in blue of the content marketing and link building being kind of a traditional um, SEO tactic in red decreasing there. Um, now, it's important to say that, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the Gartner hype cycle before, but this is a really interesting way of thinking about the relative popularity um, and the hype associated with particularly products, but also kind of marketing techniques and um, challenges as well. And I think that content marketing is probably either somewhere for various people, either at the peak of inflated expectations, where they have perhaps unrealistic expectations of what content marketing can do for them for a business, or perhaps has even gone the other way into the tropical solution, where people are perhaps I'm a little bit skeptical of its value. 
at different people at different stages. But I think actually what we're always heading towards is kind of plateau of productivity, where we're realistic about what a, a method or approach can deliver for us, um, but also kind of are able to take advantage of it. Now, in the world that we live in of content being shared ever more widely on social networks, on you know between people on email, and you know content being at the very heart of things, exceptional content is taking all the rewards. Because if we see that there's more and more people thinking about using content to market and promote their business, that creates a real, real challenge, right? Which is the abundance. Never have more businesses, organisations um, been trying to produce content to promote their businesses. But also, never have there been more people setting up as publishers also producing content as well. Never has there been more users able to generate their own content that can be very, very popular and very, very widely shared. Um, a quote I often know, like to set the scenes with when I'm talking about content marketing is Seth Godin, who is very much the guru, um, but he does talk about content being the only marketing that's still left. Now, I'm going to concentrate today predominantly on tools that you can use to try and make your process of content marketing more effective. But I do think it is useful, however you're going about content marketing, however you're dealing with the challenge of um, promoting your business via content, it's good to have a framework or methodology that you use. Now, one that I've used it, um, a few times over the years that was kind of involved in um, the method that we would use at the agency I've been involved in is theme. Now, you can go about content marketing however works for you, but I think this is a good way of thinking about it and setting the scene a little bit for what we're going to talk about today. So theme is an acronym, as was often the way with many of these um, kind of models, and it starts off with T for tribes. Now tribes again is a bit of a Seth Godin um, connected idea there, but really that's about persona development, about customer segments. And you're asking yourself, who are the potential people um, who would be interested in content that I could produce? Now often they'll overlap quite nicely with customers of yours, so it might be okay, um, I know a target customer of mine is um, a couple who are 40 to uh, 55, who live in the home counties, all of those things that you probably know about them. That could be a useful content idea as well. But often you'll have tribes that aren't necessarily customers of yours. They might be trade journalists, or they might be, if you're a job board, careers, university advisors. It might be, um, you know, the customer and the decision maker is different from the person who reads the content who shares it. So. Whenever we're working on a content marketing project, we try and identify these tribes, and there can be a number of them. We want to know things about them. We want to know uh, what kind of websites do they visit, what kind of social networks do they use, what kind of content do they share in terms of types of content, be it video, be infographics, be ebooks, um, but also kind of is it positive? Is it about self improvement, or is it about avoiding negativity, or all kinds of different things? So we're trying to develop this persona, and you might already have done this. Um, you might have these ideas of personas that you're targeting. If you've got them already, you're in a great place to deliver that for content marketing. So for each of those groups, we want to understand what about our business is compelling to them, right? We want to understand what is our hook. Now sometimes you might have these clear ideas of who you're targeting, but there's nothing about your business that's special to them. Um, and if that isn't the case, if there isn't something special about your business, that's when you need to go a bit back to the drawing board. We try and follow through this process. We're understanding what is it that we do that's special that they're going to be interested in. And it's only then that we start thinking about the type of content that we can be producing. So rather than saying, okay, I need to write an ebook, we go, actually, who am I trying to target and then determine if an ebook is the right approach? Instead of thinking, oh, we need to do a podcast, we need to do video, we need to do uh, you know, any of these types of content that we could be producing. We start with the audience, start with what is interesting about us to that audience, and then think about the best piece of content that's going to appeal to that audience, but also get across what's special about us. Then also another key step in this process, and I am skimming over this quite quickly and can do like full day workshops on just exactly this, um, is marketing, right? It's not just enough to produce the engaging piece of content. And this is where I, I see a lot of, um, um, content marketing projects going wrong. Um, they produce some exceptional quality content that is really well connected and designed for their audience, but it doesn't take off. And you need a marketing plan for that piece of content. You need to think about who are you going to pitch it to? Are you going to advertise it? Social advertising can be a great way to share content. Um, you need that marketing approach there for the piece of content. And then finally, as every um, good model does, you've got the feedback loop. So you've got your evaluation. Content marketing isn't a one-off project. You'll be constantly producing projects. You'll have different timelines for things that you're producing. But you need to know what's working so you can learn from that. 
and you need to know what's not working so you can avoid the mistakes that you've made previously. And that's quite a quick sort of whistle-stop tour of a potential um, strategic model of thinking about content marketing, but one that hopefully will inform a little bit more now I get down into some of the tactical nitty-gritty tools that I'm going to talk about. Now the first of these, um, some of these tools you may have heard of, others you may not have heard of. In some cases, actually, if you use them in the past, they've gone through some quite dramatic changes over the last sort of six to 12 months. Now the first of these is Buffer. Now Buffer is a tool that allows you to schedule and plan your updates for social networks, particularly Twitter, but also LinkedIn and Facebook and so on. Um, now you can do, this functionality exists in a number of other platforms. If you're using Hootsuite, for example, you can schedule tweets and updates in, in Hootsuite. Um, if you use TweetDeck for Twitter, you can schedule the updates there. But I really like Buffer because it gives you some analytics about the content you've scheduled through it, and it also helps you understand the best time for it, and is also really, really good at understanding when you've got things scheduled, because it's very easy when you're scheduling things to find yourself sending out three or four tweets within two minutes of each other, just because that's how the schedule's ended up. Buffer helps you avoid that type of thing. So it's worth spending some time with Buffer, because it's great at helping you scheduling and planning the best possible time to share your content. Next one at all that is one that I see used less frequently, but I think is really, really powerful, particularly if um, the type of content you're promoting has hashtags associated with, with it. So perhaps it's an event, or perhaps there's a hashtag used in your industry or sector um, that you know is really widely used. Now, Blue Nod is a free-to-use tool. Initially, there is most of these tools are free, so there's free functionality that you use, and there's further functionality, and all of them are pretty good to use with the free functionality. And what Blue Nod allows you to do is put in that topic or put in that hashtag, and it creates a kind of network graph uh, for people who are tweeting using that hashtag or tweeting about that topic. Now, it shows you co the connections between them, but also the size of the circle in this network graph shows the relative importance of that. Now, the tricky thing about content is knowing who to reach out to, who to build relationships with, who to get involved in your content. You can pop in your topic or hashtag into Blue Nod, and quickly see who are the people at the center of this social network, the people who are most influential, and potentially they're the people that you're going to want to be building relationships with. Another tool that does something slightly similar, but actually I think is much more um, easy to use, um, Blue Nod is very good at visualizing and getting a snapshot, but it's tricky to make actionable. Um, TweetBinder, on the other hand, is very, very actionable. Now, there's a variety of things in TweetBinder, but it helps you find influential tweeters around a topic. And the particular screen, the particular functionality that I really enjoy is this that I've got the screenshot here. And it shows me for a particular hashtag or topic who were some of the most active tweeters around that, um, who had the highest impact, um, who were the most popular, and also who was creating original tweets. Because sometimes those first three columns, who's the most popular, who's the most active, who's having the highest impact, can often lead to people who are just retweeting. And that can be good to know people who are retweeting content in your space. I like to know who are the originators, who are the people who are doing it. And across these four different lists, I'm able to get a really good idea of who's influential. And you can do this really, really well. So I organize a lot of events. One of the things I want to see is who is attending my competitors' events and really, really doing a good job of promoting those events for my competitors online. I can put their hashtag in, see who those um, people are who are influential, and then see about can I invite them, can I give them free passes to my events. Now, a tool that I imagine many of you would have already heard of um, is Clout. Now, Clout's been around for a number of years, but actually recently they've made a bit of a pivot. They've changed their business model. And if you were skeptical of Clout in the past, I think you should really, really revisit it. Because what Clout did in the past was try and estimate how influential someone was. So I could say, I've got a score of 55, so they're more, therefore I'm more influential than this person who's got a score of 45. And there are all kinds of issues around that. But what they've pivoted to do is to actually try and save you time and effort finding great content to share. Now, this can be a really good place to look, but if you're just, you've got a quiet half hour and you want to find some content that would be interesting for you to research, but the best way of using it is going into Clout. They see the topics that you tweet about frequently and then make suggestions of other content that other people are sharing about those topics that your audience might find interesting. Calvin, can I just ask a... What we've got here, we've got two examples. Yeah. Sorry, Calvin. We, we, we may have asked a question, which is, could you let us know if any of these services are free or paid for? Uh, I mean, Clout, I'm aware, is, is, is free. Uh, yeah, but Clout is completely free, yeah. And in, in most of the tools I'm talking about here, um, in fact, all of them have a free element to them. So 
and those that are paid for are all freemium. So in most cases, what the, the main difference between the free tools and the paid tool versions are kind of how frequently you can use it. So in all of these cases, there's a free version that you can use to try it out, see if it works for you. Um, none of these like seven day trials, they're all ones where kind of you can use most of the functionality for free, but then there's a couple of power features, power elements to the tools that you might want to pay for. So they can things like saving your history or sure. um, nice PDF outputs and that type of thing. And most of the screenshots I'm using and the examples I'm talking about is the free versions of the tools. Um, with all of them, they want to get you hooked on them and then you become more, like Blue Nod, for example, um, gives you a 48 hour window in the free version. If you want the pay for one, it gives you a seven day window. So it's that type of change in functionality that you've got there. And I'm a big um, believer in trying tools out for free and not paying and signing up for all kinds of tools that you never use. So there's a lot you can get from these tools for absolutely nothing. So yeah, cloud particularly, there's no charge associated with it. Great, uh, thanks. Model is around advertising. So yeah, in the particular example we've got here, um, I talk about Brighton a lot. So we've got a story about Brighton and Hove Albion. Um, and I talk about social media, so it's a good social media story. And there were 10 or 15 recommendations there right right now. So if you want to populate your account with topic, with content that's relevant to your business, go into Clout and they'll have some recommendations there for you. Now another one, and this is um, perhaps similar to Blue Knob, but a little bit more wider. This is Bottlenose. Now Bottlenose is really, really good at helping you understand the zeitgeist or what the population as a whole is far more interesting. So if you imagine the trending topics that you see on Twitter, um, Bottlenose is sort of like a super powered version of that. Now this can be very powerful if you, particularly less so for B2B organizations, but for B2C, um, you know, to consumer businesses, it really helps you understand what the people in your country, your area, are really, really talking about and getting excited about. And often this will be kind of TV and big cultural events like that will be influenced. So it gives you a real opportunity to look at and understand. Now, if you want to try and tap into a bigger trend and kind of piggyback on what people are already talking about, um, bottom ways is a good suggestion for exactly that. Now I'm going to move on a bit more to, we were talking particularly about kind of influential people. Um, now the content, it's not all about Twitter. I talked a lot about Twitter there. Um, there's Facebook, there's LinkedIn, there's Google+, there's Pinterest, there's dozens of social networks that people are using. Um, and BuzzSemo is uh, a good tool. It's not actually that widely known or that widely used. But essentially, it allows you to identify um, the most shared um, links and you know who are key influencers and people who are sharing that, but particularly the content that is being widely shared on a website. Now, I recommend going off and using that for your own website. Start off and see what of your content is being widely socially shared. And because sometimes you'll find social networks that you weren't thinking about, perhaps you don't have a Pinterest strategy, but people are pinning your content, content on Pinterest. Um, so put your own website in, that's the first place to start, because when you're thinking about the pieces of engaging content you need to be producing, see what's already resonated on your website with your audience. But the real power, the real way that you want to use BuzzSumo is to put in your competitors and see which of their pieces of content are doing well. Is it list posts, do they do well? Or actually, is it more in-depth pieces that are getting all the social shares? Or is there certain types of content that tend to do better on Twitter than on Facebook. So on this one here, I just took a screenshot of Brighton, a very broad topic of city. Um, and we can see the top result there, um, which was a YouTube video, widely shared on Twitter, 400, only 63 shares on Facebook. But then the one below that, which is from a snowboarder magazine um, about Brighton as a topic, far more Facebook shares, far fewer Twitter shares. There's interesting patterns, and there will be ones in your space where there's um, things that are particularly popular on one social network that you hadn't perhaps thought about. Another very similar tool, um, one that's been around for a little bit longer, is potentially a little bit more powerful, and particularly from an SEO perspective, is Social Qualytics. Now Social Qualytics does, to some extent, the same thing. You put in a competitor, it goes through all of their websites, finds the pages on there, and allows you to see which of them are getting most widely socially shared. And what's interesting there is it also gives you things like response codes. So it allows you to see if they've moved the content. It also allows you to, it categorizes the type of content as well. So was it a video that was being widely socially shared? Or was it a um, blog post? Or was it an infographic? And that allows you to make decisions about the media formats that are going to work quite well. And this kind of fits into when I was talking about the theme methodology. When you're doing your tribes, um, you know which websites are your competitors. Put them into a tool like BuzzSumo or Social Politics and see what content 
is doing well for them. That will help you make the right decisions about what your engaging content should look like. Another tool, this is again a freemium one, but everything that I'm showing here is from the free version of the tool. In fact, I don't pay for a premium version of this tool because it's so powerful in the free version. Now, Follower Wonk is most well known as a search engine for Twitter profiles. So it allows you to put in a term and then it will search for people on Twitter who have that word, term or phrase in their biography, which is very, very powerful. It allows you to do things like journalists and yoga. And you can find all of the journalists who like yoga. Very, very powerful. The way I've been using it a lot recently is when moving into new spaces. So we're doing a new event about email marketing. I know a bit about email marketing. I know a few people who are influential on it, but I don't know it as well as some of the other spaces I operate in. So what Follower Monk allows me to do is I can identify three people um, who I think are influential. Then it looks at who is following them and who they are following, and then overlaps them using a Venn diagram. So if we look at the example here, this is from SEO, but it's three different people, and I can look at and select the people that all three of them are following, or people who are following all three of them, or any combination thereof. If I look at the people all three of them are following, I can see the people who are right at the center of that community, who are the most influential people in that space. I can click that, I get a list of those people. Within Follower One, I can very easily follow them on uh, Twitter, or indeed very easily set them up as a Twitter list, so I can keep track of those people there as well. So that's hugely powerful in terms of finding these influential people. And once you know these influential people, they're either people you're pitching your idea to, they're people you might be interviewing, they're people you, you might be getting feedback on, they might be people who you're sharing their content in the hope that they then follow you and later down the line and share your content. Now another tool um, is Google Trends. Now this is probably one of the oldest tools out there, but is in still incredibly powerful. Now Google Trends shows you seasonal variations in what people are searching for online. And you can compare different terms, you can compare different countries, you can limit it down to even just London or just the North East or, or whatever it is. But it allows you to try and understand when you're planning your content, when is the time to release it. This particular screenshot we've got there of Google Trends is the search popularity for contact lenses. A couple of interesting things going on. The general decline in interest there. I tick the forecast box as well, which gives me Google's forecast of what they expect the next 12 months worth of traffic for that term to be like, which is again really, really powerful. But I can also see an interesting thing there. Now, personally, before I look at this, I think contact lenses, okay, when might be the popular time of year when people are using contact lenses? Well, would it be, I don't know, January, New Year's resolutions, maybe? Um, or would it be the summer when it's hay fever and sunglasses and all of those types of things? Well, no, it's not either of those two locations. It's actually October. And it seems to be connected to people getting coloured contact lenses um, around Halloween. But people buy more normal, conventional prescription contact lenses in October than they do any other month of the year. Now, I wouldn't have guessed that, but with this data, I'm able to understand that's when the peak is and therefore release my content at the time of the year when I'm most likely to have success with it. Similarly, in terms of understanding the type of content you should be producing, there's a tool called Ubersuggest. Now, what Ubersuggest does is it scrapes the results. When you go into Google and start typing, you get those suggestions there that pop up. Those suggestions are driven by what people are interested in. Now, I can put in a term here that says laser eye surgery. And it gives me suggestions like laser eye surgery costs, risks, reviews, gone wrong, procedure, astigmatism, NHS forum, and UK. I've got 10 great content ideas there straight away. But what Uber suggests does even more is it doesn't just go like there are the 10 suggestions. It then does the equivalent of laser eye surgery space the letter A. You get 10 suggestions where all of that fourth word begins the letter A, the same for letter B, and so on and so forth. So what you get are these great ideas, these great long tail, really specific terms that people are interested in and searching for. Now, whether you turn that into a blog post, you turn that into a podcast topic, you turn it into a Q&A section of your FAQ, it doesn't matter. What does matter is you now have a better understanding of what the people in your industry and in your space are interested in at this moment in time. Another tool. Now, this one's used very, very widely in the kind of conversion rate optimization or usability world. It's called Five Second Test. Now, what Five Second Test allows you to get cheap and quick feedback uh, typically on design. So you send them two wireframes or two versions of your logo or three versions of your logo and you'll be able to see what 
users think it's the best. So you can settle those arguments in the office where it's like, well, do we have a red logo or do we have a, a green logo? It's great for testing those types of ideas. But the way we use it in content marketing is you're going to produce a really complicated infographic or you've got three or four versions of a microsite you're looking to design, or even if you built an ebook and you've got two different versions of the cover. Five second test allows you for, you know, ten, fifteen dollars to get some great feedback on what's the best option. Now it allows you to remove yourself from that equation because often when you've been involved in a big piece of content, um, you get really, really involved, you get personally connected to it. It's sometimes good to get some distance and some objective feedback and five second test is perfect for that. Um, and another good tool, um, Google Consumer Surveys is perhaps the biggest, but there are a variety of tools out there that do this type of thing. And essentially it allows you for not a lot of money, hundreds, uh, not thousands of pounds, to get insightful statistics and research. So you can find out things about your space. Um, a great example of Google Consumer Surveys that a friend of mine did, um, essentially for a bit of a joke, um, she asked um, people to name, a, um, Americans to name a city in England. She felt that she could get some interesting results out of that. She got things like Paris, France, Ireland results. She got some great coverage off this kind of simple survey that only cost you know, um, a couple of rounds in the pub. Um, and Google Consumer Survey allows you to ask these survey questions even if you don't have a list. I'd recommend, um, if you're at all doubtful about the power of surveys for content marketing, to pick up a newspaper, pick up a copy of the Metro on Monday or this evening when you're um, traveling back from work. Just look how many of those stories are based upon a survey that someone conducted. Um, now those surveys are easy to produce if you've got your own mailing list. Just send a question out to your mailing list. But if you don't have that big mailing list, things like Google Consumer Surveys are really, really powerful as a means of getting access to those statistics. Another tool that I've only started using recently but is genuinely having a really huge impact on how I deal with content projects. And it's called um, Real Time Forward. And essentially, it's a collaborative, saveable um, whiteboard, virtual whiteboard. And it works really, really well if you're working in teams on complex projects, particularly if there's a visual element to them, or if you just want to conduct some brainstorming. And what it allows you to do is divide um, your board up into different projects. So if you work agency side and you've got lots of different clients, you can keep them separate but still have them all within the same system. Um, if you're working internally in-house and you've got bits that you're working on for one team and bits you're working on for another team or different tribes that you're targeting at different points in time. It allows you to differentiate them, keep them separate, but also keep a really good um, record of what you're working on. And also it's much easier than email. If you ever sent one of those emails where you're trying to describe the bit of a picture or the bit of a design you don't like and you use three or four paragraphs to try and explain the bit you don't like. Real-time board, you just use an arrow Everyone who's collaborating on the project can see it and see where you're coming from. Another good tool that I like um, is ImageRadar. Now ImageRadar is like a reverse image search engine. So you put in an image and it shows you places on the web where that is located. Now you can do a bit of that in Google Image Search. You might have done that before. But ImageRadar is really, really powerful because it's like a power version of that. So it shows you things like you can see who's using your images, but you can sort them by the number of times they use that image. We can sort them by the domain authority, so how trusted that website is. And it also allows you to keep track of it even if you're not checking daily, where a Google image search you have to go in and check. So if you're designing infographics, um, or you're designing any kind of visual asset as part of your content marketing, I recommend going into ImageRadar, seeing who is already embedding it on their site. Now if you've got an SEO challenge, you can then ask those people to link to you, which can work really, really well. But even if you're not doing this for SEO reasons, it's good because you can see who is it who has published your content in the past or who has published your competitors in the past because they're people you're going to want to build relationships with and when you next release a new piece of content, you can tell them about it straight away rather than relying on them having to find you and the content that you're producing. Now, not a lot of people um, give Google Plus the respect it deserves, I don't think. I love Google Plus, I think it is very much the future. And even if you don't think it is going to get as big as Facebook or Twitter, that doesn't matter. It's still a very big social network where lots and lots of people share lots and lots of content. One of the clever things that Google Plus do is their ripples functionality. What it allows you to do is see how a term or a particular piece of content spreads throughout their network. And it's kind of an animated version of some of the 
uh, network graph that we talked about earlier on in our presentation. Now, Google Ripples is really, really good at helping you find those people who are the, you know, if you've ever read um, The Tipping Point, the people who are those influencers, the mavens in The Tipping Point, which allows you to understand who are those people you want to see your content, who is those people who you want to let their network know about what you as a company are doing. And Google Ripples is a great way of visualizing that. Now, if you work for a, um, an agency and you're trying to report on your project work, or if you work in-house and you're trying to show your boss, um, often kind of statistics about the number of likes you've got, or um, how that's gone up over time, how many tweets you've had, can be a little bit dry and a little bit to Excel. Something like Google Ripples, if your content's been widely shared on Google+, Plus, is a very visual and intuitive way of communicating how those improvements have been made. Now, I appreciate there's a huge number of tools there, and I, I know we're going to send across the copy of the the slide, but what I wanted to get across is that content marketing is a really, really important discipline that I imagine many of you will already be involved in and participating in. So you're definitely on the right track there by being interested in it. Um, hopefully the fee methodology gives you an idea of one of the ways you might be able to go about um, turning that um, tactical work into something strategic. And hopefully the suggestions around um, those particular tools might make it a little bit easier for you to do a little bit better work on your content marketing. Kelvin, thank you very much. We have a, a time for a few questions, so two or three, so I'll, I'll kick off. Um, yeah. One of the questions that came out of this, the, the webinar was, what's your view of content marketing penetration amongst brands? In other words, are they actively treating content marketing as a specific strategy that they're integrating into their other marketing activity, or do you think brands are still, you know, need, there, there's an education piece that needs to be done in terms of truly understanding what content mm -hmm. marketing is? What's, what's your um, view of that? Well, I think, I think most organizations that have um, digital marketing campaigns in place, I think, are doing some elements of content marketing. Whether they're calling it that mm. is perhaps a different question. Now, if they're doing any kind of SEO, any kind of link building, they're going to have to build content in order to get those things. If they're doing any kind of social media marketing, they're putting content up on their Facebook profile to try and get people to interact with them. That's some element of content marketing. Sure. If they're producing adverts or uh, catalogs or any kind of offline material, they're doing some kind of content marketing. The challenge is, I think, in most organizations, is that lots of people have some level of responsibility for content. Um, the difficulty is who leads. Sure. So I think actually, um, I think there's a way, you know, there's going to be senior people in organizations who are perhaps not quite as um, up to speed with, uh, you know, the way things are headed. But I think most people are pretty savvy. I think the challenge is going to be, who leads? Is it the PR people? Is it the search people? Is it the social people? Is it actually customer service in some cases? Is it a marketing thing? Is it a sales thing? Mm. And I think that's the challenge. I think the challenge in content marketing for me is less about convincing people that it's a good idea to be making content. It's about the practical, pragmatic aspects of how do you deliver that content marketing in a way that's cost effective and that delivers what the business is hoping it's going to do. Sure, sure. I guess also the measurement. I mean, if it's if it if it's not uh, integrated and it's very siloed across an organisation, it's about who owns the measurement as well as the actual the strategy and the tactics. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think I haven't, I didn't even really touch too much upon. I've, I mean, some of the tools like BuzzSumo and Social Crawlytics will allow you to look at pieces of content you produce and see how many people shared them, but it doesn't doesn't help you understand. You know, did you get more sales from it, and were they sales incremental or you know, is is one piece of content um, far more effective at converting people into buyers than another piece of content, even if it was less widely socially shared? And that's tricky, right? And I think you know, um, any kind of digital marketing has measurement challenges, and there isn't a perfect solution out there for that. But sure. I think what you should understand is you've got far more data, far more insight than even you would have had a couple of years ago. Um, and people produce great work and built great businesses without that insight. You, you know, we've got more. So hopefully we'll be able to do a better job than you know perhaps people who went um, who did the work in the past. Sure, absolutely. Okay, we've got one other question regarding. It's a slightly curveball question this one, but it's an interesting one, and I, I've often discussed it myself on SEO courses. Um, when yeah. you look at content marketing from an SEO perspective, in light of Google's Penguin update, would you consider link building to be a dirty phrase? Uh, I quite like that question, and I'm inclined to agree with it. But I'd, mm. I'd, I'd like to get your view on that as well. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, I think that. Um, Google have really changed the parameters about what is and isn't an acceptable link. Um, but in many cases, I don't, other than maybe some of their most recent changes around guest posting, I think generally all they've been doing is catching up with what they've been saying for years. 
So it's perhaps the stuff that we knew, as, or link builders or SEOs, felt they probably um, was against Google guidelines. They felt it worked, right? Um, and all of that's gone now. It's not an option. Um, you know, directory submission, article syndication, simply not an option now. Um, sure. You know, whereas in the past it might not have worked, now it's probably going to actively harm you. Now I think um, the distinction between content marketing and link building using content is blurry. Uh, but I think it's better if people think about it as content marketing because there's a subtle shift of philosophy. Right? So it's actually less about how do I get this thing that helps me in Google, and instead it's about how do I make this thing that people will like which in turn will help me in Google. Mm. And I think that's a subtle distinction between the two. But I think people who are thinking about the content first, people first, search mm. engine second, um, tend to do well. Which in many ways starts, that... started with Google Panda really, didn't it? I mean, it was all about the user first and the search engine next, uh, which is absolutely right in my view. You know, so. Yeah, definitely, yeah. I think it's the way it should be headed, that's for sure. Uh, Katie's got a question, and I've, I've been looking at this question trying to figure out the answer, and I actually don't know the answer, but I'll read it oh, out. Well, How that much help me then? <laughs> <laughs> so Katie's saying, I'm trying to find a platform that will show me um, how to share, uh, sorry, show me, allow me rather to share Pinterest and Instagram content as well as Twitter and Facebook. Um, so Katie uses Hootsuite, which, which we mm. do as well at eMarketeers, mm. uh, but of course Hootsuite is limited to Facebook, Twitter, mm. Google+, LinkedIn, but, but what about mm. Pinterest and Instagram? Any, any thoughts, Kelvin? on those two channels. I mean, I think, yeah, I think they're particularly challenging. I suppose the difference is, um, and the reason why perhaps there's not been the integration there that you might expect in the way that there has been, is that predominantly um, the other, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, Google+, Facebook, are text-driven. You have the ability to share photos, but it's predominantly text plus photo, whereas um, Pinterest and Instagram, you've got the photo plus text. So it's kind of a, a subtle distinction there. I don't think there's one killer solution, but what... I will say that um, you know Hootsuite are the leaders and all this type of thing, and they are probably going to be at the forefront of any changes that are there. But what I will say is, if you are using a tool and it's not doing all of the things that you want it to do currently, you wish there was something more it could do. Let the company know. All of these companies have you know huge forward plans of what it is they'd like to do, and I bet probably in most cases they already would know about the things that you'd like them to do. But by telling them, by sharing that feedback, they're able to hopefully push that a little bit up their agenda, a little bit higher up that development queue, and then maybe get it to do what it is for you a little bit quicker. I think generally, you've got a tool that's working for you 95% of the time, there's a bigger danger in changing tools or changing platforms than there is in terms of giving that nudge and to hopefully make it a a two or three month away thing rather than a six to 12 month away thing. Yeah, thing. couldn't agree more. And if, if anyone's going to be responsive on Twitter, on Twitter, it's going to be Hootsuite. So far, Katie, fire up a tweet to them, see what they say. I'd be very interested to find out what, what their view is. Um, so, Kelvin, thanks very much for really, really some great insights there. Uh, fascinating stuff. And I'm sure most of you will find some of those tools particularly useful. Just a very quick plug of the next webinar, which is particularly important. So Friday the 16th of May, uh, our Google Analytics specialist, Remco van der Beek, will be talking about upgrading Google Analytics to Universal Analytics. Uh, so he's going to be talking about why is Universal Analytics so important and what steps you need to, to take to actually upgrade, uh, which apparently is not too complicated. It sounds scary, but it's okay. So um, all free, uh, log in on Friday the 16th of May, and we look forward to seeing you then. So many thanks, and have a fantastic weekend break, everybody. Thanks for now. Bye-bye. Yes, thanks. Bye. Cheers, Kelvin.